we had a baby after 17 years. That was like four and a half years ago. So when we started going to doctors, I started sort of had to learn what's going on here. And you didn't go to medical school, you didn't do any of that, but no. you have more knowledge probably than many people. In- Most doctors. <laughs> actually, I had no internet. I actually went to Brooklyn Public Library and took out some medical books and I started reading. You hear that kids read, <laughs> read books. We don't realize our lives, the way the from lifestyle is structured is around kids. Yeah. You didn't have children for 17 years and you were actually more blessed. So 17 years obviously was a journey. You think no one in your community is experiencing infertility, something you're missing. This happens very often nowadays. A lot of people in many different communities. Litfish, modern orthodox, Hasidish, it doesn't it doesn't pick. It's it's everywhere. Statistics today are one in six. Wow. One in six couples. One in six couples. So that means if there was a minion, there's at least one person. And that's the reality. I guess take us through the, the moments of I guess a breakthrough of, of finding out that there was success and that and then having that child. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. Welcome to all our new listeners. We picked up from our last episode with Ayelet El-Nakave. This is an episode of Meaningful People with Reb Mordcha Kenig. Reb Mordcha Kenig, rather. And he is the Director of Medical Affairs at a time, an incredible organization. And around a year ago this time, we had uh, Rabbi Shaul and Bronny Rosen, the founders of a time on this podcast. And let me tell you something, spoiler alert, this is an amazing episode. Besides the fact that Rabbi Madcha went 17 years before he had his first child, the amount of work and knowledge he has in the area of infertility and the sensitivity that he's been able to help couples with is absolutely remarkable. And there's so much in this episode. I do want to mention that my good buddy, my co-host, my partner in crime, Momo Bauman, will be at the Shasathon, which is taking place March 3rd in Kalahari with his learning buddy, Cheskiasaf, and they're going to be completing Shas together with hundreds of other people in that room that day. Go ahead to the show notes and the link of this episode and support their page on the Shasathon. If you enjoyed any episode at all of Meaningful People, go ahead and support their page for the Shasathon. We want to give a big thank you to our friends at To 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 Tovito because you know what? The days of putting your kids in front of Netflix, YouTube, or any of that stuff is, is over. You just need to veto. You just need to veto. Whether it's Bella Bracha, Kivi and Tuki, the Pintalach, McGillis Lester, you got to have a Tavito account. Your kids are going to love it. You're going to love it. You'll feel comfortable standing there, making dinner, doing your work, and hearing songs that you agree with. Not like, oh boy, <laughs> got to skip that one. That doesn't happen with Tavito. So make sure to go ahead and head to Tavito.com. Use promo code MM10 for 10% off your account. You're going to love it. And a big shout out to a new partner of ours at Laman Achai. Laman Achai is this incredible organization that is founded in the year 2000. I want to tell you something pretty cool about them. You know the quote, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So they developed an entire chesed organization off of that concept. Giving people the ability to stand on their two feet, not just putting them on our shoulders and handing them things, not a hand out, a hand up. That's what Laman Achai is all about. They give them, they give the less fortunate the tools to break the cycle of poverty, whether they need therapy, career guidance, vocational training, whatever it may be, Lamanachai is there for them. And they're doing something pretty incredible this other. They have this new campaign called Hug a Hero. Go to their website, hit the show the link in the show notes in the description, and you could basically put in your name, your email address, and a personal message for a wounded IDF soldier, and it's going to be given to them in the form of a chocolate bar. And they open that chocolate bar in the candy wrapper is going to be a beautiful message, a personal message from you to that soldier. I'm so happy we get to partner with Laman Achai on this. Go ahead to the website, hit the link in the show notes of this episode and send them some chocolate and send them some love. Hope you enjoy this episode. and I'll see you in the middle. You are listening to the Meaningful People podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential and meaningful people. Ramot Chakanik, thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast. Martcha, what's machsta? Is that Yiddish or something? Yeah. Okay, good to know. It's Yiddish for how are you, dude? <laughs> oh, the dude part. I think. Yeah, you, yeah. I think you made it up. Um, but how are you? Baruch Hashem, Yeah. 
I know you mentioned that this is your 17th podcast you've done in your life. <laughs> no. Erroneous. Uh, but you, know, you, you haven't done podcasts, and that's the perfect guest. We always like guests who are just fresh to the space. But we're just going to have a schmooze, and there's just going to be a few uh, hundred thousand people perhaps listening. I don't know about that. Maybe. Who knows? Um, the good thing is that we're not live. Yeah. That's we right. always said it. Yeah, you know, when exactly. You, when you're live, that's, you know, there's no, whatever you said. Yeah, like say say your social security number right now. We'll take, <laughs> we'll take it out. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, but you have quite the story and quite the journey. You're doing some pretty holy work. So I guess to just dive in um, from Aleph, tell us about you, about uh, about your about your journey, and then we'll talk about, of course, the time. Thank you so much. So, what, where do I start? Um, I guess at the beginning, you know. <laughs> yeah. You got married. We had a um, we had a baby after 17 years. That was like four and a half years ago. Wow. And yeah, so 17 years obviously was a journey. And again, as a, on a personal level, this was a personal journey. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's out of that journey, my position at a time sort of evolved. Yeah. I'd like to talk about that journey. If you could, if you could take us into those, I guess, those early years, mm -hmm. many times people get married and right, the expectation is right away, hopefully within the next few, you know, a few years as kids and everything. And in this case with you, that wasn't, that wasn't happening. Yeah. So our... Actually, our journey starts quite early. I mean, there are some people that it takes time for them to realize that they have a journey. By us, we actually started the journey quite early. And quite early after the Hassan, we started our journey. And the journey was obviously a journey from ups and downs, um, better times, wor better days, worse days. Was there something that signaled to you early on that it was going to be difficult? You said in contrast to how some couples... Learn about it. You, you you knew right away, not right away, but again, we started our journey quite early. Um, we very very early realized that we might need some help. So what happened was, like everyone, um, I reached out at a time at that point. Um, I also had, for Hashem, that had a great my great uncle was Rabbi Gissinger from Lakewood. Rabbi Gissinger is that Oh really? He was my great uncle. Wow. And Adichas. he was probably the first person, the first to rov, to really delve into infertility and really know the infertility space. So obviously when we started off having issues, I reached out to him also. Me being the type of person that I am, I'm a person that I really need to get to the bottom of something. Whatever I do, I need to do it all the way. I need to really understand it. Uh, you know, it needs to make, make sense to me. I need to know the science behind it and what's the what's the thinking behind the solution that we're su suggesting. So when we started going to doctors, I started sort of, I had to learn what's going on here. Obviously, I had no idea. So I actually went up to the Aton library. I took out some books and I started reading. And the more I read, the more I... I was I was interested to learn more and more. And as time went on, more and more time, obviously the doctors became more frequent, the treatments became more, more intense. More intense. Yeah. And so the more I was going to learn. So actually, I had no internet. I actually went to Brooklyn Public Library and took out some medical books, and I started reading. So you went, I went to, learn more you went to medical school, basically. I, <laughs> That's, that's what I like to say. I mean, that's yeah. what they told me, told me really like. Um, so I had one of the doctors that suggested to me that they should grandfather me into a medical license. <laughs> <laughs> um, that the... And if that, he pulls that off, they'll probably pull his license. <laughs> so you could just, they could just give it to you. <laughs> exactly. Very good. He's, he's a zero-sum game. He, yeah. he's actually, Here's my license. He's probably on the way out. Yeah. The times are tired, so uh, yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't hurt him. Um, the At that point, medical referrals generally was not, were not what they were today. Today, every organization has this, that, you know, you, when you ask for a referral, they ask for your records, they, they get to the bottom of it, they they try to find solutions for your problem. At that point, I would say most medical organizations, not just for fertility, for everything, was how did it work? They had their three or four doctors, and they, that was the referral that they gave. 
So I obviously started going to the doctors that I was given to. Right. But again, the more I learned, I was like, it 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 I, it didn't fit with me. Like you know, there must be more. There's more. There, there are so many doctors out there, and there's more to learn about this field. So the more I wanted to learn, the more I wanted to hear. And at one point, a time made a medical conference before COVID. Everything was in person. Now everything is online. Yeah. And we did like a few conferences after that. Even after I joined, we did a few conferences. We had like over thirty. Um, medical, the biggest doctors in the world come together. So to me, that that was actually the first thing that I joined by a time, was the, a medical conference. To me, like that was like, I mean, you went as a as a, as a couple, as a, as a couple, right? To me, it was like I, I saw opportunity to learn more, to to you know, to to get other doctors' opinion on my case. This was like, so I went to that con- I, I signed up, I went to the conference, and there were like, first of all, I found the first time really that I was in a group of people experiencing infertility. Somehow I never joined any of the support groups. I was more to my more to myself. Right. So that I went to that conference I really the, the medical part of it really interested me. So I joined it. And so first of all, part of the conference, I felt like a child in a candy store. Like, so you know fascinating, I mean? by the way, just to open the parentheses, what drew you there, based on what you're saying, is the your, yeah, <laughs> your intellectual pursuit of the 30 biggest Correct. doctors in the field. And Correct. you were doing all this research and you were learning, but you had this sense that there was more to know and Correct. you know further advancement to, to, to get to. And that's what drew you there. Absolutely. But what that actually did as well is it connected you with other people that were going through the same thing. That you that's again. exactly what I'm saying. That, amazing. That, that I really, I never, I never wanted to open myself up to be a part of any support groups or anything. So this was the only thing that, that I went, of course, yeah. for the medical part. But, you know, as I said, the high side, that opened me to the whole group support, everything that from that event. I guess wow. bef- before the, before that, though, I mean, um, you and your wife get married and this, this is obviously something that's it's not push it where you, you realize that there's a situation here and you have to see doctors um, and I don't know the statistics. Maybe the, this happens very often nowadays. There's a lot of people in many different communities, Litfish, modern Orthodox, Hasidish, it doesn't, it doesn't pick it's, it's everywhere. One of the things that I do routinely is when I'm speak, I do routinely sharing for Abonam, training for Abonam. Mm-hmm. Um, I do it, I do it local. I, I did it in other out of town. I did some training for Abonam and I always tell the Rav, if you're a Rav in a community and you think that, if you have a minion and you think no one in your community is experiencing infertility, something you're missing. Statistics today are one in six. Wow. One in six couples. One in six couples. So that means if there's a minion, there's at least one person. And that's the reality. That's the reality of things. There's a reasons. There's, there's different a minion, there's closer to two. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. if, if you have a minion and you, you're telling me that someone, you have, you have no one that is asking you about the infertility questions, Something you're missing. There's someone over there that is experiencing infidelity and is not sharing with you. But you yourself, you know, you mentioned that you you wanted to keep it more to yourself. You don't want to go to support groups. How did you, how did that evolve for you and your you and your wife in that situation? Meaning, ultimately, you had to open yourself up more and be re- be on the receiving end of help. And 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 personally, I'm asking you if like you know, getting to that moment of being vulnerable and saying like, we need help and this is uncomfortable. What was that that process like for for you guys? So again, it was interesting. To, it was very different for me than for most people because I came in. I said when it was mostly the medical I did myself. So even though, but I did. I said I did reach out. It started off. I had first of all, Baruch Hashem, I had great support. My parents, her parents, were very supportive. Um, I didn't need, and I had my great uncle that. Um, that I was able to reach out to. Right. So I came. I started off with a position of very well, being very well supported, and the fact that um, that I had the medical knowledge, I was sort of learning on the job, and I felt the that I, you know, that I'm, I'm that I'm learning myself what. So it it came from a different angle. It's kind of unbelievable. Like you, you, uh, you went, you didn't go to college. Did you go to college? No, I you, learned. You didn't go to medical. <laughs> like you, you're literally, you're the medical director. Spoiler: You're the medical director for a time. Director of medical affairs. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be an MD to be a medical director. Correct. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay, well, he's almost. I mean, <laughs> just eight years of schooling away. So you're the, the director of medical of affairs, and you didn't go to medical school. You didn't do any of that, but no. you have more knowledge probably than many people. In, most in, doctors. <laughs> <laughs> from just hitting the library and hear that kids read, <laughs> read books. Now, again, Baruch Hashem, I have gotten a lot of good connections also. So right. the, the position that I am, it gives me exposure every day to different doctors. So I have a lot of exposure. To, so for example, a doctor works in a certain practice. At a certain extent, they're, they're in their own bubble, bubble. Yes, they attend conferences, but again, they're practicing within the practice, the way there are certain guidelines that practice practices. Every most centers have their what they do, the way we do things over here. You know, every every yeah. hospital, every university has this like the culture over here. We do it this way, and the fact where I am, I have exposure to multiple. I mean, the, the sky is the limit, Baruch Hashem. So I have I have the access to so many doctors, so many right. So many, we could talk more about research, but so many research people. So I get, I have a lot of access today, which gives me exposure to different ideas where a doctor only has their own. Right, because yeah, they, they are, uh, before we get to the, the manifest, I wanted to throw yeah. in also, you mentioned about access to doctors being such a valuable resource. And before you walked in, we were talking about my yeah. grandmother, my bubby Tenenbaum in Toronto. She should be gazint. One of her favorite jokes from Jackie Mason. Was Rab talking rabbi about Jackie Mason. Yeah. You know he was a rabbi, yeah. Nice. Uh, he would talk about people bragging about their doctors. My doctor's so big, <laughs> so big, you can't get in. If you could get into the doctor, no one wants to see him. My doctor's so big, you can't get in. You can't get in. <laughs> no, my doctor's so big, no one's seen him yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because it's probably her granddaughter, you know? Like, that's how it works. <laughs> but before we get into the, the medical stuff, I, you know, you didn't have children for 17 years, and you were actually more blessed. And that, that's probably longer than than a lot of people have to wait. And I don't know, again, maybe you know the statistics. Once a, once a couple is waiting that long, if it does end up happening, I guess take us through the, the moments of, I guess, a breakthrough of, of finding out that there was success and, that, and then having that child. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. Um, so getting... Through the process, you know, the, the position that I was, Bar Hashem, I was able to see a lot of breakthroughs. And, you know, I have seen throughout the years, again, I'm not saying the numbers are very are a lot, but I do see here there like people that were married longer than me that I was able to help them. So obviously being in my position and and not just from the outside, you know, in in, in the inside, being involved with them, helping them, the fact that I was able to help them out and seeing success obviously that to me a whole time gave me more and more hope for success um so it was to a certain extent the position that i was it sort of that itself gave me constant hope well when did you have that when did you when did you gain that position with the time okay so what like, happened was, was at what part of this okay so after i'm so getting back to so after that conference Kaki's looking to build a timeline here. yeah, <laughs> yeah. so after that conference that I attended. In 2000 and 2006, I think. Okay, we got a timeline. In 2006, <laughs> I attended that conference. I was still learning at that point. And as I said, I was doing my research at a side, but right. I was still learning. Um, and there was a friend of mine that, that I, I knew him from Shul, that he was at that point working for a time. He was doing um, bookkeeping. So I met him at the conference. I was like, oh, wow, you work for a time. Wow. Like, whatever. Like, what is prestigious position? Like, what is he you have? And again, we started speaking, and he, he, he knew that um, what I was doing. Again, and I, I got to know some Rabbanim privately. But again, I, I was, I'm a nature very quiet person, so I wasn't public. But, you know, he knew that I had some connections to some Rabbanim. So he asked me, like, could I set up a meeting with you with Rabbi Rosen? I was like, great, yeah. Um, so that's sort of the, how the connection happened. Um, Rabbi Rosen, for anyone that is not familiar, is together with his wife. The uh, co-founders. Right? Co-founders yeah. went on. Yeah. Well, in 2006, how, many, how long were you married for at that point? For you. Um, it started probably, so again, this wasn't 2006. It took, you know, that I got to know him. I would say probably I joined probably like 
more like 2008, sort of. So you're married six, probably six, six years. years. Yeah, but I was still learning then. So at that point, I was like, I, I you know, I, I didn't fully join at one point. Right. You know, it took it like a process. But it's interesting because you, you, you joined the time while you were still in your parsha. It's not like you attained and you learned and you got to the pinnacle and Baruch Hashem, you had a child and you, you joined, you joined the time while you're going yeah. through it. Because like, as I said, I felt, I really felt that there was a need um for this, this type of really understand real understanding. And as I mentioned, um, I had my great uncle of Gissinger, but I don't know if um, everyone that knows him, he had his doctor out, out, out of, out Jersey slash um, Philadelphia that he used, but me living here in Brooklyn was not a Mahalach. It was extremely hard to reach him. I remember I, I set up, the, I used to set my timer, my, my alarm clock. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, was, I remember I used to set up my alarm clock for 2 a.m. To, to ring because that was the time I was able to reach him. Wow. Rabbi, Rabbi Gissinger? Yeah, definitely. Wow. Again, the, 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 the books on him, they're, they're, I'm sure there's yeah. a, there's a lot, a lot about him. I mean, he's a real godl. Um, godl in, in godl, in, godless and godl in chesed. He was uh, very close to the every train. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, correct. So, um, so, so it was very hard to reach him. And the same is the few other people that, that knew of Landau from Borough Park, you know, the few people that really knew they were almost irreachable. So to me, to join this organization was something, again, I felt that there needs to be more people, um, you know, handing, not just hand-holding, because that was a time was doing the hand-holding part. Um, you know, the expertise, the expertise, the expertise to that. Also growing up, I grew up with, the, from, with, with, the, with, um, with Chesed. My father was... My father um, still does. He's partial, he doesn't do that much, but I mean, when I grew up, he was one of the biggest politicians in Muncie area. He was involved in a lot of politics, oh. and again, he was a hard, he was he worked he had his full time job, hard worker. But he was a big, he was a, uh, he was doing chesed. So to me, um, at home, we always had people coming calling. They needed to speak to an emergency. You know, people coming down, um, having meetings in the living room was was a daily thing. So, you know, I grew up, like, my father was always busy with chesed. You know, that was something that I grew up with. I got married. My father-in-law is someone that's extremely... My father is Ramon Rosenberg. He's the head of Ches Shalem's organization. Oh. So It's your father-in-law. It's my father-in-law. Mm-hmm. So I got married, and actually I joined him in Ches Shalem's. At that point, I still had more time in my day. So I, I helped him out in Ches Shalem's also. So the fact of have, taking... Um, doing such a type of thing, chesed, was something always in back of my mind. I remember I was learning for quite a few years and like I was thinking like, you know, at a certain point I had like sort of a guilty feeling like what am what is going to be my place in the in the world of Chesed? Like what am I going to do to for the Klal? For living to, for the Klal. So That's a tremendous uh, way to think. So to me, when this opportunity came up, it just it just made so much sense for me to do that. And as I mentioned, I remember growing up um of I remember when his father was by him in Lakewood, so I, um, which is my great, which is my great grandfather, I went down there. I used to be there. I remember in his living room, which was his waiting room, people sitting there like all the, like for hours waiting to. And I always grew up looking up on that, you know. So to me, this when I when this opportunity arose, it was like, it just like it was, I re, I really was happy about, I re, really excited about it. And as I said, I started off part time. Then I really got involved. Part a time, very deep. <laughs> Sorry. So I wouldn't curse if I were. <laughs> I would refrain from using profanity. <laughs> Anything short other of that than is that, fine. feel free. Okay. So I'm sorry. So at one point, um, one of the board members from a time called me, and the Ravash, which is the Rav Machshav from Ashgocha, wanted me to get involved with Ashgocha. So a time Ashgocha program is basically when there are fertility treatments, where when there are gametes are being handled, we do Ashgocha. We, there is Ashgocha, there's always a Mashgich, a Mashgich, a whole time observing the process. We'll be right back to this episode of the podcast. But you know what? Is it a Meaningful People episode if we don't speak about our friends at Ceremian? Albert and Associates, you want financial bliss? You want to make sure your family's taken care of? You know, I just got a phone call earlier today asking me questions about Albert and Associates surrounding me, and they say, well, 
tell me a little about about the way they manage the money and and the interactions you've had with Moshe. Let me tell you something. You have money sitting there in your account collecting dust. You want your money to be making money, and that's why you need to call Moshe Alpert. No more dust. There's enough dust sitting in your basement probably. You don't need that in your bank account. Give Moshe Alpert a call today, 718-644-1594, or email him at alpertmoshe at gmail.com. And it's time to have your money make some money. You deserve it. You work hard for it. And it's time that you break free from the dust and turn it into gold. Now a quick message from my friends at Base Shalom, Yeshiva of Postville, of Shalom Mordechai Rabash, and started this yeshiva in Postville, Iowa. And while they may have fewer kids, they give attention to detail to every single bachar. If Shalom Mordechai Rabash can put his blood, sweat, and tears into crafting this yeshiva, and it's very, very worthwhile to support. So they're actually having an incredible auction right now. You want to win a trip to Israel? Do you want spectacular trip with KMR on vacation? I do. How about a Shaitel? How about a $3,500 Amazon gift card? How about jewelry? How about a Megillah, which, come on, Perm is coming up, and all other case? Huh? How about all that stuff? Well, you got to be in it to win it. You got to go to charity.com forward slash the auction of Postville. Hit the, sh- the link in the show notes, the description of this, ep- description of this episode, and you have a chance to win and you support the incredible yeshiva that Rav Shalom Mordechai Rabashin started. You want these prizes? Uh-huh. You definitely do. Buy a ticket. Get a ticket and all those things. Go to sleep. Maybe wake up with a voicemail saying, hey, you won. That would be pretty cool. Until then, enjoy the rest of this episode. The only two Hashgachim centers that we feel that are in their own side very careful. We like to do the bigger centers where the chance for error is almost nil because they're like the, the, a lot of the big centers that the ones that we use are they have their own safeguards. They they don't they're afraid from their own side. You know they don't want lawsuits. They don't want to mess up. Yeah. They don't want to mess up. And they have triple double checks and triple checks from their side. But again, we still want to add our to have a from guy or from woman. Wouldn't it be the opposite? Wouldn't you want to do hashkach in the places that are more likely to make a mistake? We don't. We don't think that people should use those places. Uh-huh. Okay, I understand. We don't people. We don't, we don't think people should use those places. If, if a place that you don't trust, meaning if a time is not there, then maybe don't use them. Type, type. Exactly. Right. You know okay. I mean, if it's a place that you, you really need to, you know, that you really don't trust, you know, is that is that really a place that you want to work with? Right. It's so yeah, you want your hashkacha to be an added measure of Correct. supervision as opposed to creating the baseline of safeguards. Right. Yeah. Correct. Sure. So. At that point, um, Ashgoch used to be, um, so at that point, um, Rabbi, the board member called me to Rabbi Ash wanted want me to get involved with Ashgoch. Obviously, I had no time at that point. I was so busy. But again, he, he begged me, he, he nudged me, and I took over the Ashgoch at that point. And for a few years, I ran it. And at that point, we expanded it exponentially. We we got it into new, the new centers, we got into, we upgraded Ashgacha. We added new chimras, new ways, better ways of sealing stuff. We added new, new dimensions to it. Today, it's a huge program. Today, we have, um, I think, with uh, like more than fifty mashgiches. Wow, that are they're constantly seven days a week, even even Shabbosim. Because what happens is, there are they. Every time they open up the the gametes to work with, the mashgich has to be there because it's if not mashgich is not there, it's sealed. Mm-hmm. So if they're going to open it, we have to have a mashgich there. Every weekend we set up probably ten ten mashgichs in the in, in the city. Go there over Shabbos. To be there over Shabbos to be to be able to be there during Shabbos to, while they open wow. it. It's like something you don't think about. You're at home eating kugel and chal, and there's a there's a guy in the center or a make, woman it or a like. woman oh, yeah. making sure. That they're, that's unbelievable. I, I remember. would speculate also, I, but I, I'm wondering this. I would speculate that from the provider standpoint, when they see that dedication on the part of the organization and on, on the part of the couple that is going through that process as part of that medical practice, when they see that level of dedication and devotion and commitment to the process, I imagine that moves things along or it, it infuses it with a certain meaning that wouldn't otherwise be there 
without the hashkacha. Does, does that do you find that to be the case? We had actually one of the doctors tell us that the patients that have hashkacha, if they take them as a category, their success rate is higher. Wow. He 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 was looking at it from a different from the other side around. He was like he wanted to make sure that doing hashkacha doesn't in somehow some somehow compromise the success rate compared to the right. general population. And he, what he came back telling me is that actually overall statistically that those patients had a higher success That's rate. Fascinating. That really how is. Do, and how do they explain that? Yeah. I'm not sure. I think that it's certain type of I think what you said had a plays a big role in it. It's the type of attention more, to detail. More respect. Every, it's attention to detail also. A big part of everything. Like the success from everything when you look at this what is this what is the success in something depend? It's never the big picture. It's all those tiny details that, the detail. that you that you that you focus on that gets you the the end of the end game, the end outcome. Yeah. When we when we interviewed Rabbi, Rabbi Rosen, I remember him saying that when he, he he walked upstairs to get his umbrella that he left upstairs, and he walked into the office and the doctor was just looking over, pouring his over his folder, file. Pour, pouring over his file, and it's it's that attention to detail that you see, like the difference between a success and not is is was what. You tell me. I don't know. Yeah. Like it's, it's very hard a lot of times to say what it was that what made the success, what didn't make the what made the dif- the, the difference. And Baruch Hashem, I was able to, you know, it, it takes a lot to get to convince the doctors to allow Ashgacha because no one really, no one wants anyone looking over their shoulder. So um, yeah, so it takes a lot. Baruch Hashem, I was able to, you know, it, Baruch Hashem, I had a good, I have a good rapport with the doctor, rapport with the doctors, and I'm able to. To, to to facilitate that and I'm able to get but again it takes a lot um I even one one time they had me there was one of the other countries that they were having issue with Ashgacha there and the doctors couldn't wouldn't wouldn't cave so I flew out there actually to convince them to to, to allow it wow so you know what I would imagine that the the connection of Kal Yisrael the obviously Yisrael right the the love that the Jews have for each other I would imagine that that plays a role a little bit in the providers not feeling threatened by hashkacha. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to picture a, a scenario where no doctor feels threatened by a spouse who stays in the hospital room to watch their spouse in the hospital bed overnight. They don't feel like they're being watched. They don't feel like they're, you know, they don't feel like anyone's over their shoulder because they know that the reason this person's here is because they love the person that's in the hospital bed. And when that hashkacha is happening and another Jew is taking out of their time and taking out of their life to be there for this couple and to watch what's going on, the doctors can pick up on that love because it's the love that's driving the person to be there and and hopefully that helps them not feel threatened that, oh, they're, someone's looking over their shoulder. And from, from the other side, it works the other way around also. For the couple going through infertility, it's, it's sometimes it's very like a, you know, they're taking my they're go, they're going to create my child sort of in the lab. Like they take off, they, they're taking out my eggs, my sperm, and they're going off the corner and they're going to do something with that and then transfer it back into me. It could feel very like very aloof, like very disconnected. The fact that they feel like they have the mashgir there, right. like like. Being there, the extra, I, I say, the Bajik is the first babysitter that those embryos have. <laughs> they have their extra babysitter in the Good room. Um, it, it gives a certain amount of, besides the Ashgocha part, it gives a certain comfort, a certain connection to those embryos mm-hmm. out there. Wow. We have some of our Bajik say, tell them, you know what I mean? We'll really? say, tell them while, the, while, while ICSI is done. You know, that's sort of a, you know, it, it adds a certain specialness to it. Sure. That's so nice. I mean, I, what what I, what I'm thinking a lot about is like we're you know there's a lot about what you do with the time, but all while you're doing this reading up and all this hashkacha, you yourself are going through this. How do you how do you balance going to bat for other couples and working on their cases and talking to couples while you are also going through this at the same time? How do you balance that? Humans human emotions are complex, and. You know, we always say the same thing. That one thing that makes you happy one day will make you sad the next day. So it's very hard to say to put it in one box. Right. There were definitely days that I would say that the fact that I was able to help other people helped me, and there were other days that actually, like, well, why can't I help everyone else, not myself? So 
you know, there were there were days that are like we all we all have happy days and 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 and, and the opposite. So yes, there were definitely days that were extremely difficult in that perspective. But then there were other times that that actually helped me out. The fact that like seeing constant hope and and being people being helped people people being helped is it was a huge um, which a huge source of chizik for me. And you know people sometimes ask me like how do you do this? And I say like walking down Thirteenth Avenue and seeing like one scroll and seeing five babies that you know that you helped come down here is. Is a, is a feeling that can be described, and does that happen often? That you see sure, couples a lot, a lot. out and about, sure, daily, daily. It's There's, probably difficult for them to express to you, as well. Absolutely. And again, as I said, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. There's a very big part of it is about privacy, right? And I, I, I never, I, you know, I never approach everyone. No, I, I don't know anything about anyone, you know. I, usually, I don't even go to Simchas. People call me. I just don't want people thinking that 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 this is why that person. Oh, can't, he's here. He's here. Yeah. Sometimes I won't even go. Like even if there's a chance, I won't even go. Um, I had one one funny story. I had my sister. My sister got married, so Shabbos Shavuot, um, Shabbos Ofruf was in a different shul. So I was davening Shabbos morning. We davened in the shul with Ofruf. And the uncle, my brother-in-law's uncle, came over to me. He tells me, you know, I know there's a lot of organizations that are helping people with infertility. But, you know, there's one organization called A Time. And there's a guy there. I have to get you the name. I'm not sure what the name is that my daughter spoke to. She spoke to everyone. No one was able to help her. Only one guy in A Time <laughs> was able to help her. Like, I was like... Thanks so much for the information. That's, I really do appreciate it. That's probably so hard for you, no? To, to be able to like, like swallow it? It's like, <laughs> no, it was me. So she I know. Me. So but like, I, was like, I was like, thank you so much. I was like, okay. And you couldn't tell him it was you. I, I couldn't say anything. That's amazing. That's all oh, the temptation. It's like unbelievable. That's, that's, that's really incredible. That's really incredible. <laughs> so I said, there's, there is that part of, of, of privacy, obviously, right? Of course, we deal with such such sensitive topics. I'm sure, it's a very big part of it. And you, yeah. I imagine you you speak to a lot of couples, and sure. you and you are doing a lot of counseling and talking to them about just the medical track that they're right. going to be going Absolutely. down. What what I mean, what was that like? You know, before you, and we'll get to the part where you Baruch Hashem, had a child, but before you had a child, you're speaking to couples constantly. Um, what was that like for you? And what were those conversations like? Again, I. I did not do a lot of self disclosure mm -hmm. because, as as anyone in in counseling will say from the therapy world, that self disclosure doesn't really help usually. Interesting. But what, what I did say is, and what we keep on saying is that anyone that works for a time has gone through this journey. The emotional part for infertility is very different than a lot of other. Again, every every challenge is unique. So what I'm saying is a time is um I'm saying, I'm saying infertility is unique. Right. I'm not saying just infertility because the reality is every challenge is unique, unique exactly, in some way. 100%. But infertility is unique in a certain way that, for example, when a person has Khadashon cancer and they have the challenge of cancer, it's it's very hard to deny it, to live in denial. You have a here a diagnosis, and you know the diagnosis and you know you have to do something about it. On one hand, infertility is something that you know people go for a very long time in denial. Like, no, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. On the other hand, with, when a person has a have a shalom disease, they really are sick. They really are sick. When someone has infertility, the person really is not sick. So, how do you define the challenge? Like, you know, how do you find that challenge between all the other challenges that all the surrounding people around you have? Right. So it is very unique. It's also unique in another way. We don't realize our lives, the way the from lifestyle is structured is around kids. Yeah. Everything, the way we do it is around our families and our kids. When a person doesn't have kids, there are a lot of the routine things which we don't think, we don't even realize that we're doing it for our kids. 
their the whole structure of the life is different. For example, I just thought about that. I'm like, you know, going down yeshiva week. You know, everyone has to has to fly out of town yeshiva week. For a couple that doesn't have kids, they don't want to fly out yeshiva week. Yeshiva week is the time the one one the one week of the year they don't want to be in Florida or whatever without whatever other place everyone goes. Right. So well, everyone else like it's usually the wife will say, well, all my siblings are going down together to Florida, yeshiva week. So from one hand, do I go along? But I don't have I don't want to go to Florida yeshiva week. I want to go when no one is there. A lot of those a lot of those structures it comes to yomtiv. The whole we don't realize how many part of the yomtiv is structured around kids. Even Purim, yeah, like Purim, even like say, every, say single yomtiv, every single yomtiv, every single yomtiv. Chalamoid, going chalamoid rides, yeah. yeah. It's like it became like chalamoid rides. It's it's really who goes chalamoid to adult rides. Chalamoid, chalamoid is the time you go to kids rides. Momo does sometimes. <laughs> Momo he's big. He likes rides. I'm saying is that the, the, our whole so many things are in our. And out the way it's structured is structured around kids. Hundred percent. And when you you don't fit that cal um that that cal that um you don't fit that category, it's not just you don't have kids. There's so many structures in your life that you don't fit mm-hmm. with the what we call normal. So you feel like like an outlier, right? And it's not even a matter of being insensitive, right? When someone right. when someone sets out to be sensitive to other people's plight or other people's circumstances, the avoid is to be sensitive, to be aware of what a person is going through, and to keep that in mind and to be mindful of that. But here, as you're pointing out, it's systemically, our entire society is built around a certain structure, and it's it's it becomes very difficult to be sensitive. Are you being insensitive by... Going for Yom Tov, Chas Right. But someone that unfortunately was not yet zeichet to children, they're going to be unbelievably emotionally triggered and activated by the fact that the societal structure exists in a certain framework, and right now they don't fit into that framework. Awesome. It's it's excruciatingly painful. Exactly. And this is why one of the things we do at a time is we do those events. We always do events right before Yom Tov. And, for the you know, and uh, For the couples. We always will do events before Yom, for every Yom Tov, before, again, support groups, things, to just to prepare them emotionally. You know, when you go into a challenge, you know, it's going to be difficult and, you know, we'll get through it. It makes it changes it. So this is why all the we always do events before every Yom Tov. We have events and get together just, you know, to prepare for the sort of, you know, for the, for the, what's going to happen, for what's going to happen sort of. I think uh, you're uniquely positioned um, to, to speak to couples. You said, you know, we said one in, one in the six couples are, are struggling with this. So if uh, theoretically speaking, if 50,000 people are listening to this, Momo, the quick math is one in six of them are struggling with this. Nice. The answer what is. What was your number that you used? 50,000. One in six. Wow, he calls himself an attorney. Sixty <laughs> percent of fifty thousand. He knows medical. one in six, not sixty percent. My bad. No, one in six. I'm yeah. gonna get a surly, uh meme out of this one. Yes, yeah, I facilitated <laughs> this one. Thank Anyways, you. It's, it's it's a whole lot of people, and because you went through this yourself, I'm curious if you if you have any advice for this thing that you just mentioned about every antif, every aspect of life is different. Um, what advice would you give to that one in six that is struggling with with infertility? How to navigate. Be yourself. Be yourself. And again, it's it's very hard because when a person is triggered, it's very hard to think rational. And when a, if, if you wait for being triggered, it looks to you like everyone is insensitive. Preparing, preparation for everything is the key in everything. So prepare yourself. Listen, I'm going to be triggered, and but no one means it. Hopefully, most of the time, no one means it. Um, no one is no one is trying to trigger you. You know, um, do what's comfortable for you. Don't feel obligated to do things that 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 you don't you feel are totally out of your range. But understand that no one really wants to trigger you, and coming to that with a in a prepared manner 
makes a huge difference. And, and, and again, because of the position you were in, if you could also give a piece of advice to, let's say, parents of children who are going through this, and they sometimes don't have the full story, the full picture. It could be the couples trying to do it with a time or with other organizations or just go through it themselves and not, should a parent pry? Should they try to find out? Should they? What's the advice to a parent? You've dealt with so many cases. What would you say and you've seen is, is like the best route? <sighs> I wish, I wish there was, there was I wish there was a quick answer to that question because every every situation is so unique. Yeah. What I would say is most of the time people are helped. And what I would say is offering advice it depends depends a lot on okay, this is it's a very loaded question. Sorry. Every <laughs> case is a, every case is unique. There's so many different personalities, so many different the kids, the parents, family structures. Everyone wants to be good and everyone wants to be sensitive. Parents, the biggest concern for a person is the fear of the unknown. And this is why I think parents are so stressed out because they don't know. Right, they're on the outside. And they're on the outside. And a lot of times the problem that the kids have are really minor. But the, the parents don't know that even. So, you know, the, 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 your, the fear of the unknown creeps up and that makes it even much, much more difficult. So what I would tell parents is most people, overwhelming majority of people that we deal, couples that we deal with will get helped. Um, the kids are in a vulnerable position. A lot of times one of the one of the partners wants to share, but it's the other partner that doesn't. And since this is a couple's journey, it's not one partner could do, decide what the other what the other one should do. This is really a couple's journey together. So if really one partner feels comfortable sharing the other wasn't, I think the parents have to expect that. Offering advice is usually not very helpful, but sharing, and again, I tell the kids also to acknowledge that, to tell the parents, I know that you care about me. So sharing, caring is sharing, meaning the fact is, the, the biggest thing is share the fact that you care, expressing that you I really care, I'm here for you, and keep the conversation open, the fact that if there's anything you need, we could, um, you know, that um, that you could reach out. It's very interesting because it's like it, it's not just uh, sharing is is caring, but it's more like, but don't don't step beyond that as a parent. Like, don't try to diagnose your kid. Don't try to say, well, maybe this, maybe that. Right. But, well, offering unsolicited advice has broad application right. Right, as, <laughs> as being yeah. unwelcome. And specifically when uh, a Is couple... The, appli the application broad? It ha meaning it has application broader than this particular Correct. scenario. Example, yeah. But I, I, I would imagine, and I'm hearing this from you, that couples that are going through this, a couple is comprised of two oilam moles, two P individual people which well, usually are not on the same page. <laughs> well, usually, <laughs> right. The nature of a couple is that yeah. two become one, and any couple's shalom bias, the rubber hits the road on their shalom bias as they endure and encounter challenge. A thousand percent. And how they navigate challenges, that is the shalom yeah. bias that emerges, the harmony that emerges in the bias. And when there's no children in the equation, that system becomes tested. And very often, what, what I see is that when couples have children, their whole shalom bias very often revolves around their kids. And when there's no kids in the equation, that really tests the relationship. And parents of that couple, in order for them to take on an appropriate role in the shalom bias and the well-being and the happiness of their children, is a function of their willingness to express that they are there for their kids. They're open to be there. They're not offering unsolicited advice. They are there to be there supportive to their children, but the children have to be in the driver's seat to dictate 
in what manner the parents can be it's hard supportive. Though. It's hard though because they're very vulnerable. No, who is the the kid is in a very vulnerable place, and it sometimes it's maybe not. You think it's comfortable for them to be so uh, assertive with what they're comfortable and what they're not comfortable with? I, you know, I don't know. So all of this is communication, right? All of this it's is exactly it's communication, and I actually encourage usually the kids to approach the parents oh, and yeah. acknowledge that. You know, like um, like own it up front. Like exactly, approach them and say, "I know that you care." I know that you care, and I think that 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 the, the few I know if if there was anything, um, I know if there was anything that I could ask you for, you would do it to me. Right. I think that in most cases, that diffuses the situation because those parents most likely in any situation have spent and are spending sleepless nights with so many burning questions and wondering and wondering right. and not sure what to do, not sure what to do. If that child comes to them and says. We're, Baruch Hashem, we're getting help. Said, that's what I'm saying. We appreciate you. We know. I think that you're yeah. out here. But then what I get from some of the kids is, you don't know my mother in law. Uh, if I'll say that, I'm put that opening. on a sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know my mother in law? Yeah, you don't know my mother in law. <laughs> that's like, that's, that's, not yeah. about my mother in law. I'm just saying, <laughs> it's not my mother in law. My mother in law is the best. Yeah. Anything else you want to get on the record? <laughs> <laughs> Because my mother-in-law is the best. <laughs> so they say. Yeah. It's definitely a challenge for Shalom Bias. The a challenge going to going through a challenge together could do does wonders to a certain extent. Meaning it either tests it, but you know, if you're tested and 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 and, and, and you work it through, it actually brings you much closer together. Mm -hmm. Some pressure either bursts pipes or makes diamonds. You no, know? that's just really what it is. So Nachi. <laughs> Menachi. Nachi. How are you doing? I know. I think our mother in law started a podcast today. <laughs> no? <laughs> Son in laws of meaningful people? Very, yeah, very good. No, that, that's 100% correct. That's uh, I, I agree with you. And that's, and that's what I see. Yeah. I imagine. I see you can see it. You know what I mean? It's Yeah. We'll be right back to this episode. But first, a word from my friends at K K Collars and Co. The best shirt company in the world. You got to go collarsandco.com. They didn't hire me to write a song because I am tone deaf, but they have the best collars. They have the best shirts. You know, this week I was heading out to an event and I put on a different shirt and I put on a sweater over it. I'm like, this just doesn't feel right. This is erroneous behavior. No, but it just didn't feel good, to be honest. And I'm like, hey, look, my Collars and Co shirt is right here. I put that on. And like, I felt like a million bucks, you know, like that line, you're not your, you're not yourself when you're hungry, eat a Snickers. You're, you're not yourself when you're not wearing a Collars & Co. So put on a Collars & Co. Head to CollarsAndCo.com. Use promo code MEANINGFUL for 15% off right now or any order over $100 and be yourself because you'll feel good and look good. And while you're looking good and feeling good, you know what? Maybe it's time to replace the appliances in your house. Maybe you're doing a new construction. There's no one else to call besides... Say it together with me, kids in the car. Yes, Town Appliance. Ever since what year? Yes, 1979. I'm quizzing you all. The best appliance store in the entire world is Town Appliance, and they've been killing it ever since 1979. Your Bubba's Bubba was buying from Town Appliance. It's a family biz. You got to keep it up. Washer, dryer, refrigerator, oven, sink, whatever it is. Town Appliance is the people for you. They understand the needs of the Jewish community. They understand how you work, the seasonal needs. So go ahead, hit the link in the show notes in the description of this episode. Send them a message on WhatsApp. As easy as that. Can you send a message to your local appliance store on WhatsApp? I don't think so, but you know you could. Town Appliance. So go ahead, hit that link, and enjoy the rest of this episode. Take me through um, the the moment of you welcoming a child into the world, your your child. Shem does wonders. And we don't know always why problems happen. And not always do we understand exactly why Hashem decided at this particular point to help you. We live in we live we live by Chesed Hashem. Yeah. And it's really Chesed Hashem. That's all I could say, really. I, I, it's 
that, that's all I really I have to say about it. It's like, you know, it's we, um, you know, you really don't understand why you went through what you went through for so many years. And then, you know, Hashem says it should happen. I once said for the new light, I said, shit from Adam. The three partners in a person, it looks like that in, Hashem, the mother and the father. Hashem, yeah. the mother and the father are the shitfam. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Hashem is is full of the whole world. Everything is His. Like, what, how, what does it mean a shitaf? And that's sort of a. It seems that there's a, a some kind of special intervention that He has. That he has here, and you know, when a decision is made, it it you know, two partners can't make a decision. A lot of time, it's the third decision. It's for the third partner to sort of make the decision that you know, now I want, now 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 I'm okay with it already. To right. you know, that's sort of the way I look at it. You have a, a boy or girl? A girl. How old is How old is she? Four and a half. Hashem. So yeah, that's sort of the way I look at it. That it's like you know, Hashem had one of. So obviously, I have a lot of doctors they're very close with, and they all called me. I got quite a few calls. Like, so what? What happened? Like what? Like what do you do? Like what? Like oh, was do, the break, you, they want to know what the breakthrough was. Like, exactly. Like you're doing so much research, and I was like, Hashem is in control. Like I, I really don't know what to tell you. What was the simcha like in the family? I mean, everyone was my father, my mother. I mean, everyone was just like beyond. How about you? What were you feeling? I can't describe it. I mean, I I've never knew that you could feel so uh, have such feeling. You know, what I mean, I never wow. knew that you could have such feelings. And What's you, your daughter's yeah. name? Sima. And it's amazing because you devote your life to making sure or doing as much as you can to make to, to make sure that other people have that feeling that you so longly yearned for and waited for and apparently tra- cherish so much again this, we definitely you know we see this on the, and i see this on a daily basis sort of um you know it's not like just myself i mean it was a different world but i'm saying we do see we just had i just had last week i had a patient actually that that patient was sent to me from a different organization that you know that you know some people know that when there's a real hard case they'll send it a time like you know that, that right we had a case someone had a baby last week after i think seven close to eight years double di- digit miscarriages right double digit second trimester miscarriages we're not talking about just it's, and right. also was like you know like i was involved in it, like a step and another one and another one we tried this we tried that and you know we did some research till we got through that and you know where hashem yeah this was last this was just this week um just last week so it's, a, it's a it's a it's a constant a certain extent it's a constant we constantly see that did it change uh, after you you were blessed with a child did it change the way that you approached these cases did you did that change at all if anything, if it is a certain, I would say, if anything, it's a certain, again, in a bad day, I would have a guilty feeling about it. But I would say is like, like how, why was I helped, not others? But again, right. I know that I would say that I'm doing anything we as a time, not just me as myself, as a time, as Rabbi Rosen, Mrs. Rosen, the whole team go beyond, beyond, we, as that we do a lot of research and we, we do everything possible to help every couple. So, I know that we do whatever we could. That's amazing. I want to go back to something else that you said, which it surprised me. And you referenced it as like sort of common knowledge that self-disclosure is not something that's necessarily helpful. And I was surprised by that because when, when there's something that I encounter that I don't have personal experience with, I feel like my opinion is like very suspect. And I, I can't relate to that. So, so what could I possibly say? I have no way of relating. I, 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 have, I can't fathom what it means. So anything that I'm going to say after that point, it's like a big asterisk on, on, on whatever comes after that. And I would imagine that a big hurdle for someone to be open to receiving help and to, and to hear 
is to know that the source of this information can indeed relate to to what I'm experiencing and what I'm going through. And I would think that it's a very helpful tool and mechanism. So I'm, I'm curious if you can unpack. Yeah. yeah. So again, like everything, everything is complex. But what I would say is there's two points I would say. First of all, no two people's challenges are the same. Meaning even if you're going through this and this challenge, you don't, you know, two people don't deal with the same wife, not the same family history, not the same. And no two cases are really exactly the same. So let's say if you understand a person, and again, I was talking more of an emotional perspective. If Even if you understand what the person is going through, let's say, um, in the same di- official diagnosis, usually you're, you're not coming from the same background. You're not coming from the same. So ultimately, the, it's not so helpful. Ultimately, there is the big part of a big difference between the two of them. The other part of it is, um, from what, 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 from a therapy perspective, the way they look at it is you don't want to deflect the tension on you, meaning you want to keep the tension on that person. Mm-hmm. And if you start um, ex- um, self-disclosure about yourself, it sort of deflects from you. It deflects from the person that you focus on now to help, and you're focusing attention on you. Mm-hmm. So again, this is why I said that everyone that works in a time experienced this, went through this journey because I feel it's important, the general concept that we understand what they're going through, a thousand percent. But I'm saying, I'm talking more in detail, more of a detailed disclosure of like, oh, I had the same procedure. I don't feel that that is necessarily helpful. Right. right. And then as you're saying that, it occurred to me that maybe it's important for there to be that acknowledgement that my circumstance is unique to all the parties and all to all the nuances. And when when someone gets busy self-disclosing, it conflates to the person, oh, you think you know what I'm what I'm exactly, going yeah. through. Whereas when someone right out of the gate acknowledges, I have no idea what you're going through, that that is more validating than trying to come off like, oh, I know what you're going through. Exactly, because in reality you don't. Mm-hmm. The, the, the truth is you don't. You know yeah. you wow. you might know Part, part part of it, but you really don't. Is there a like a case that you were involved with? I'm sure there's hundreds, maybe thousands, but is there one that like it just sticks out to you, top of your mind, that uh, the way that it was most fulfilling for you, more, most accomplished feeling? And there were, so there are so many of them. It depends a lot also how involved I am emotionally in the, in the, with the person also. So a, a lot of times the interesting cases are not necessarily the cases that I am, that are, the cases that are more involved emotionally sometimes are because the I'm more involved, the ins and outs of the right. day-to-day than the interesting cases. But absolutely, I mean, they're constantly cases. And obviously the cases that I have sort of changed I sort of had to like maneuver my way to get that treatment done. And after that, the person gets helped. Obviously, that means much more to me. So, like, so for example, like I had a case, um, I'm thinking now of a case that someone that um, she was not responding a certain way. And I came up with, with an idea of sort of how that person should respond like with a certain protocol. Like the treatments? Yeah. Okay. And the doctor sort of was insisting that that it's not true, it's not going to work, it's not going to work. So what I did was I sent them to a different doctor, and I told the doc. So I wanted I wanted the doctor to give the specific medication as a part of the treatment protocol. I figured that that medication will do this particular thing. So the doctor insisted that they don't want to do it. So what I did was I went, I sent them to a different doctor. And I told that doctor, they should try just this medication. I want to see what this medication will do for them. And it worked. So then I sent that patient back okay. to doctor number one for an ultrasound. Uh-uh. Like, <laughs> you showboating? Like, no, I wa- because yeah. I wanted him to do it. Because I needed, I needed to be a part of the bigger picture. Right, right, right. So I couldn't, I didn't, so I just did that, that protocol just for, to show that the way she responded was actually great. So then... 
once I proved him and she did an ultrasound by him, like, oh, wow, how did he get this? I was like, well, we did this in this protocol. <laughs> it's amazing. You're so Jewish. Amazing home care. <laughs> it's amazing. So, like, That's so amazing. But it, it, it's remarkable to me that the doctor, that you've developed such a trust amongst the doctors and such a respect amongst the doctors. And this this is, goes, by the way, in, in the field of infertility and RCCS, the way they are with, with cancer. And it, the credibility, yeah. The credibility that any year that could walk in with no degree can come in there and say, I think you should do this. And they say, okay. Yeah, so it doesn't come from one day to the next. And Baruch Hashem, you know, sure. it comes with a connection. It comes with, from from proving yourself. First of all, proving yourself that I'm not here for myself. I have no, you know, when a person feels that you're starting to do it for yourself, they will never do it. Like, I have no ego here. I have no I have no benefit. For example, this case, yeah. That would be I, egonious if it was. Oh, wow. Egonious? Egonious. It would be erroneous and egonious. That's That's good. That's good. Wow, you know, so the the fact that I they, they feel that I'm not I'm I have no interest I have no personal interest in this I have no pers no pers personal gain in this I'm just doing it because I really feel that this person is going to be helped with this protocol right so that to a certain extent helps them that's that's remarkable I um and the Shasthan is coming up. Talk to me a little bit about Come that. Out. That's like a first of all, our friend over here, Momo. How are you? And his uh, partner, his friend Cheski Asaf, will be sitting there learning. Yes, what are you Subas. Learning? Subas. It's wow. a shem. And but like, what's that like being in that room? I know you spoke at one of the one of them one year, but being in that room and seeing the entire shas being completed. So as a as I said at the Shasatan, actually, when I spoke, I said to me the Shasatan was every year before I had my child. It was a very um very very confusing and very conflicting emotions a lot of the people that came throughout the years were couples the people that learned were couples that previously were helped mm -hmm. and then there were a lot of a lot of the learners are still quite a few of them are still in the parsha in the parsha and the fact of seeing like you know like this fact that this person i was able to help this person i was not able to help like it, it, it triggered a lot of emotions and seeing so many people that were previously helped and me still still being in the Parsha was also a very, very, I would say a real trigger for me. It was a very, very hard day for me. The fact that like, you know, like all those people like learning and Baruch Hashem, they're all, they're all so grateful. They were all so much helped and, and I'm still, yeah. and I'm still in this. On the other hand, the fact that there were so many people, you know, um, I'll share, my, I, I, um, there was a cane in the garden from the Shasatan. I think I think every week by the by the, by the meal, my daughter sings it all day. Wow! Because the fact that so many people being misfollowed for the couples, that to me was like, it was it was like I would say the highlight of the year, if anything. You know, it's a the the fact of so many people caring and being together and feeling it was the energy in the room. That like you know, there, there's really hope. It, it really gave like there is still hope here. You know that that that's and, really the feeling that I got from that. And I, and I feel like your presence, like you are such a such a signal of hope. Having gone through what you've gone through in the amount of years that it's been, and Baruch Hashem, you have a precious daughter Sima. People can look at you and 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 see and say, oh look, you know. Yeah. Absolutely, and again, it's, uh, hopefully, the, we still we're, we're definitely hoping for everyone else. You know, the world is a world that keeps on changing, and we are really trying to do whatever we could to push the world f forward. Um, you know, there's there's one of the procedures that I, are used that are called ICSI, which ICSI is when they take one sa one one sperm and they inject it into the egg. Um, for years, ICSI was ex it was accepted that ICSI doesn't work. ICSI really was was invented by mistake. It was a error. The doctor did an error, meaning he was trying to inject it one way and he ejected a different way. That's why you have a shkacha, I guess. <laughs> no, but it was in the same sample. Right. He, he basically he he injected it slightly different when he wanted, and he left let it grow the overnight, and he saw that it fertilized. And today there are, I think, like thousands. Of, Tens of thousands of babies born with ICSI. Wow. And 1991, before 1991, which is not that long ago, they were not able to be helped. And when I look at such a story, I think of like, you know, when are we having this next ICSI? Yeah. 
Um, to me, that's, you know, there's the Varti Gatu Mitzosa Taman. And there's a question people ask, like, if you see a Gia, why is it a Metzia? Mm-hmm. Metzia means when you find something, when you're not planning on it. Right. You're not you're not hoping for that. If it's a Gia, why is it a Metzia? And the the, the, the word that they always say is that, you know, we do a Shtadlis. And 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 the, and 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 Hashem sends the Vashefa sends the, the 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 results. So you do the yagia. The matzia is not necessarily, and that's what I was always like thinking. Like you know, when we do when we do ixi, you know, you do the yagia. The real outcome is the matzia from Hashem. And I say this is why we call it the medical breakthrough. Um, a breakthrough is it's not achievement. It's a breakthrough because nice. it's like you never know where it's going to come. We at a time have invested hundreds and thousands of dollars in research. We had at one point our own lab in one of the most prestigious hospitals. We have spent, we have done research abroad, and that's what our, part of what I do. Um, I don't do Ashgacha today anymore. How abroad like, are you doing research? Like, which countries are you going to? To we have in Israel and different countries. Um, we do, and again, all with again, because Baruch Hashem, I have the connections. So bringing together, you know, pushing, putting the extra pressure on them, you know. What else, what else could we do to you know um, to help more and more couples? Right. It's something that we were constantly we hired some researchers. We were constantly involved in pushing the envelope for the next you know to help more and more couples. So I mean, we're not happy with whatever whatever was helped. We're actively trying to help more and more. Yeah, it's amazing. I appreciated the the Nakuda that you mentioned about being sensitive to how emotionally charged the day of the the Shasathon can be. I think I recall that Rabbi Rosen and his wife were telling us that in general, fundraising for an organization that's doing this type of work is very tricky because Mm -hmm. to create a circumstance where the ones that are receiving this help, if they're made to feel that they're unfortunately needing this type of help, that's that's not an outcome that anyone wants to create. Thousand percent. At the same percent. time, there's a lot of work that needs to get done and a lot of funds that need to be raised, uh-huh. which which is I think what makes the Shasathon such a brilliant advent, where on one day, all the, there's a siyum hashas, taking Torah, and Chesed and fusing it into one, un, truly indescribable day and event. And thank you, Nachi, for the of course. And all, for the plug. Those... I, I've been zeichet to do it for a few years, and the the experience to just be part of something like this, I, I, I tell my wife every year. Like I, I really cannot describe what goes on. It's 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 a full. Uh, of course, it's the the months leading up to it as well. But that day of the Shasathon, you wake up that morning, you know, the Abister put me on this earth. To do this day today, I know exactly what my avoid is today. It's the full day. You're all in. You're learning hours and hours and hours, and raising millions of dollars for an organization that is doing such remarkable work. Putting the head on the pillow that night, it's like wow. Hmm. Like I want on the slideshow. I want them to lead like with that day. <laughs> the head hitting like, the let pillow. Let that be at the at the front of the slideshow. The the Momo hitting his head on the pillow. Good night. <laughs> Shasathan day. Good No, it's really amazing. And uh, anyone who's watching Momo's page, <laughs> we have to hit that up. Make no sure, pressure. No pressure. No pressure. But but pressure. <laughs> you watch this podcast every week. Like how? Hello. Um, but thank you for for joining us and and telling us everything you've told us. And Amir Tashem, it should be as close. For all the couples that are waiting, and uh, you could say, yeah, I mentioned um, research. The there is one of the latest research, latest latest breakthroughs in the in the world today is the uterine transplant. That's sort of that is yeah. like the most exciting thing. So I, um, what happened was when the first uterine transplant happened in Sweden, at I was at the ASRM conference, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine conference, and. The, the guy from Sweden was here, and he got a standing ovation. I went over to Dr. Falcone, which is one of the Cleveland Clinic doctors, and I told him, Dr. Falcone, when are we doing it here in the United States? He's like, we're not doing it. It's not going to happen in the United States. 
why not? He has his calculations. No one is going to give the amount of of OR time you need. It. You need a lot of OR time for the donor, for the recipient. It's never going to happen in the United States. And Sweden, there's no surrogacy. Over here, there's option of surrogacy. It's like it's never happening. I was like, Dr. 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 Falcone, we need it to happen here. And what do you know? A few years later, he was the one that did actually wow. the first uterine transplant in the United States. Wow. So in that, part empowered by you. Again, it definitely, again, he said, he said that, you know, that definitely put the seed in his mind that, you know, that he needs to get that going. Wow. So as I said, we definitely are trying to push ahead the, Listen, the what's whatever is going to be the next ICSI. That's what it's about. That is about. Um, one of the things that we did a lot of work is on fertility preservation for cancer patients. I remember the first time we did the, we, we did, um, so the best place to freeze is in St. Louis. So I remember the first time when we did that, we I we froze an ovary. She had surgery, and i i took the i took the i took the i took the the ovary. I ran to the airport, and I had to catch a flight to St. Louis. And I was like, like what do we have? Like, the, 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 and you have to you can't it can't go in through the radar. It can't go through the right the X ray because so, of the yeah, yeah. yeah. So like it's like what do you have there? It's like I have an ovary. <laughs> I was like, so you got arrested next. <laughs> And and today this is actually and so do you have a, a picture of the TSA agent's face when you said that? <laughs> and again, they, I'm sure they're used to this. They hear you all, sure they're used to it. You said yeah, all the time, <laughs> they, not, all day. Not this, but they, they hear all type. They have a special weird. lane. They have all. They hear all type of weird. Better than, weird. Better than clear. <laughs> they hear they hear all type of weird weird stuff. And actually, and, and, and today it's quite routinely. Tomorrow, actually, we're having another um over, uh, a, another girl is having an ovary surgery. And also, he's um, St. Louis. Got to run the uh, same. picking it up, taking the ovary, running over to St. Louis, petitioning Hot Salah Air to get involved. I'm just wow. saying, <laughs> where uh, everything, we're, we're, and again, and 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 what we actually got is um, now we're doing it not for, not just for cancer, for other things. We are we brought the concept of doing it for other genetic disorders that you lose the ovarian function. We brought it here to the United States, the ovarian tissue freezing. Wow. You should continue to let's yeah. like this. This is breakthroughs, Mr. Shem. You should you should you know be able to help as many people as possible and and build families. Thank mm-hmm. you so much for what you do, and thank you so much for coming here today. Thank continue you. Continue so your and tremendous Mitzia. Amen. Hopefully, Val. we'll be able to help more and more people. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast with Rav Motcha Kenig. The incredible work that a time does. Blown away. Blown away by his story. Blown away by. But what he does, can you imagine someone who didn't go to schooling, college degree for this stuff? Absolute expert. Absolute expert. The doctors listen to him. The work that he's been able to do is unbelievable. It's remarkable. And let's just all make sure that we can continue to empower him and his team to continue doing this work. It should be just that none of us should ever need, ever, ever need the, the resources that a time offers. Uh, like I said in the beginning, Momo Baum and Cheskisaf will be learning at the Shasathon, the incredible highlight of the year for this organization and for much of Kali Yisrael. So go ahead. There's a link in the show notes in the description of this episode. Support them. Support the Shasathon page. Send a donation on behalf of you listening to Meaningful People. It would be very much appreciated. And let me tell you, we're so, so fortunate that you are a listener. Please leave a comment over here on YouTube. Or if you're listening on Apple, you can leave a review, a rating on Spotify. And if you got feedback, feel free to email me at nachi at meaningfulminute.org. I go through all of my emails and I can't wait to hear from you. Until then, have an amazing week, everybody.